Welcome. This video will be going over bipolar transistors. We'll assume uh, in this video that you already have working knowledge of NMOS transistors, and so we'll be going through the bipolar transistors and uh, uh, sort of the differences between bipolar and NMOS transistors. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, this uh, video will be going over bipolar transistors. So the first thing we should uh, note is that bipolar transistors in general are not very good for digital circuits. And the reason for that, the main reason for that, is that they consume power even when no logic is switching. Uh, that's not the case in CMOS logic. In CMOS logic, if there's no transitions, um, so if all the states are constant and there's no clocks moving or anything, then there's no power being consumed. In uh, bipolar logic, that would not be the case. So you would have uh, cons uh, you'd be consuming power even when it's static, and therefore you'd be consuming much, much more power than a CMOS logic circuit. Um, the reason you're consuming power is that there's current flowing into the base of a bipolar transistor, um, as opposed to a uh, MOSFET transistor, where going into the gate is effectively zero current going into it. And they also don't operate as very good switches, and so they don't work nearly as well as CMOS. Uh, transistors for digital logic. In terms of analog logic, or sorry, analog circuits, you find there's good and there's bad. Generally, bipolar uh, circuits have lower noise, lower power, and they're faster than their CMOS equivalent. So for analog, they could, using bipolar transistors could be better. As I mentioned though, however, as a switch, they don't work as well. And there are some analog circuits, um, like switching regulators and switch capacitor circuits, where switches are very important, and operating like a switch is important, that you can uh, have the impedance, which is very low when it's on, have uh, the voltage across the switch go to zero if there's no current through it. Um, and that's not the case in bipolar uh, transistors. So that the uh, they still, even when there's no current flowing, or very almost zero current flowing through it, there'll still be a voltage uh, from the collector to the emitter, and so it doesn't operate as a very good switch. Now, there is some technologies which are by CMOS. So they have CMOS technology, and they include bipolar transistors. So that would be a by CMOS technology. And that would be very good for both your analog, because you can use your, for analog, you can use bipolar transistors where, they're, uh, where they can help out. And for digital, you can use the CMOS. However, you'll find it's not that popular a technology, and the problem for that is cost, is you've added more uh, steps to your process. Um, so generally, if you can do everything, if you have an application, and you can do that with just CMOS, that's going to, um, you'll use CMOS, that'll win, because it'll be lower cost. And so um, you'll find even very modern technologies in CMOS, they generally don't have bipolars included some of the older technologies, they did have um, bipolar transistors included in order to improve the analog performance of the circuit. So you'd see some by, by CMOS uh, uh, technologies. It's becoming a little less uh, popular these days. One of the reasons it's becoming less popular is in very advanced CMOS processes. So say uh, 20 nanometer, 22 nanometer, um, fin fats, 16 nanometer and below, your MOSFETs FT are even higher than a bipolar FT. So the unit gain frequency that you can operate them at and get gain is actually at a higher frequency for the CMOS in a very advanced technology than it is for a bipolar transistors. However, that's not the case for older technologies and older processes. And so you generally saw that bipolar was faster than uh, CMOS transistors. So let's talk about what are bipolar transistors. So bipolar transistors, we have NPN transistors and PNP transistors. So if we just look at an NPN case, so this is an NPN transistor here. It's a three terminal device. There's an emitter, there's a base, and there's a collector. So if we look at a implementation of a NPN transistor, this would be the top view, and this would be the side view. So looking down from the top, we have this arrangement and looking at the side we have this arrangement. So what we see is that we have the collector 
the base and the emitter. And if we looked at the side view, we'll see we have the collector, the base, and the emitter. And we can wrap this around so we can actually connect it in both locations if we want. We can make um, a wire connection to the collector here and to here. We can collect uh, connect to the base in this location and this location and the emitter in just one location here. So where does the NPN part come into play? Well, there's an N part for the emitter, a P minus part for the base, and an N part again for the collector. So what we see is we see NPN, and that makes it an NPN transistor. Of course, for PNP, it would be the opposite of that. So the first thing you notice is it's not a symmetrical device. As opposed to a MOSFET, there's a, in a MOSFET, there's very sim, uh, the symmetry between the drain and the source. In this case, the collector is a larger area than the drain. Sorry, than the, um, sorry, what I meant to say is that the collector base junction, which would be this junction right here, is larger than the base emitter junction, which would be this junction right here. So you can think of this as uh, um, you can think of this as two NPN, uh, sorry, as two diodes back to back. Would this be N, P, and N? But if you actually put two diodes back to back and tried to do that, where this would be the base collector and the emitter, it wouldn't operate as a NPN transistor. And the reason for that is you need to have a very thin region here between the emitter and the collector. So this region that we have right here has to be quite thin so that our um, current can jump directly from the collector to the emitter and be controlled by the base current. And that wouldn't be the case if you just put two diodes back to back like this. Sorry. So, what we do notice though is the collector base junction, as I mentioned, which is uh, this region here, is a much larger area than the base emitter junction, and the base emitter junction is this region here. So we don't have symmetry between the two, and this is a, one of the reasons we make the collector base junction larger is that in normal operation, for an NPN transistor, the collector voltage here will be at a higher voltage, a uh, significantly higher voltage than the base, and the current will be flowing from the collector through the base to the emitter. And so with the voltage drop being large across the base to collector voltage, there'd be more power dissipation in this region than there would be in the base to emitter region. So from power dissipation point of view, there's more power dis being dissipated in the collector base junction, so it's good to have the collector base junction larger than the base emitter junction. And the last thing to note is that, if you notice I mentioned this was a P, well it's not just P, it's P minus. So the base has to be lightly doped in order for this to operate properly as an NPN transistor. So the schematic for an NPN transistor is shown here where you have, you have the collector current coming down through the collector, the emitter current come down through here, and the base current is going into the base in this direction here. That would be our NPN transistor. And the arrow here shows you where the emitter is of your um, device. On the right-hand side, we have a PNP transistor. So this is a P, N, P. And so we've um, switched around the N and the P's. And in this case, the collector current is shown here, coming down through here. The emitter current is here. And the base current is this direction. And what you'll find is that in both of the circuits, the emitter current is equal to the base current plus the collector current. And in this case, the base current in a MOSFET, if you recall, we can think of this as, as um, similar to the gate of, uh, in this case, would be for an NMOS transistor here. You can think of the base as being similar to the gate, but in this case, the base current, or sorry, yeah, the base current is, non, is not equal to zero. So I sub B 
is not generally equal to zero. In fact, it has to be something for the current to flow. And we'll see what that has to be. So just like we had for the NMOS transistor, in NMOS and, and MOSFET transistor in general, we have uh, the triode region, the cutoff region, and the active region, or the saturation region. In the bipolar, we have three regions of operation as well. Once again, we have the cutoff region, we have the active region, and we have the saturation region. So in the NMOS, and this is where a little confusion arises, because in a NMOS or a MOSFET transistor, the active region is also the saturation region. So we call that the saturation region in a MOSFET transistor, whereas for a bipolar transistor, the saturation region is actually more similar to the triode region in a MOSFET. So the saturation region is where you're um, not using it as an amplifier, just like you don't use a MOSFET in triode region like an amplifier. So the so if you want to think of similarities, this is the saturation region in a bipolar is similar to the triode region in a MOSFET. The active region in a bipolar is similar to the active region in a MOSFET or the saturation region in a MOSFET. And the cutoff region in a bipolar is similar to the cutoff region in an NMOS or a PMOS transistor. Now, how do you determine which one of these regions that you're in? You determine it by the emitter base junction and the collector base junction. And just whether it's forward biased or reverse bias. So if you recall, these look like we have a diode here. So I guess actually from, let's do it, let's, let me do the collector base one first. So if we just look at the collector base one, we would have a diode that would look something like this, where this would be N and P and the voltage across that. Now we're going to consider it forward bias if this voltage V sub D is enough to turn that um, uh, junction on. So we're not going to be using zero volts and a positive voltage because even when it's positive, it's not considered necessarily on. We don't have current flow through it. So we need a high enough voltage that current will actually flow. So we're going to be define this as the, we'll say it's either reverse or forward biased. But as I said, don't use the voltage um, equal to zero being forward by uh, above, above zero being forward bias and below zero being reverse bias. What you want to think of it more as is that when the um, you're forward biased, when current can flow. So typically it's around 0.7 volts for a, um, a normal sized um, diode or, or PN junction. And if it's below that voltage, then you're in reverse biased. So if you're at 0.5 volts across the junction, you might you would still consider that reverse biased. Now, because the collector base junction, as I mentioned, is larger in area than the base emitter junction, then the forward bias turn on voltage for the collector base junction is smaller than the forward bias um, base emitter junction for the same current. So if we decide that we we decide that at, uh, 100 microamps is considered our forward bias um, current, then it might be 0.7 volts in the base emitter uh, junction, but it might only be 0.5 volts or something for the uh, collector base junction because of the area difference in the two. So, as I mentioned, what we we're looking for in the three different regions is just whether we're forward biased or whether we're reverse biased. So in cutoff, both the collector base junction and the emitter base junction are both reverse biased. We typically think of this as kind of like an off switch. Um, this just there's no current flowing. We'll see that the current is very small in that case. In the active region, what we see is that the emitter base junction is forward biased, and the collector base junction is reverse biased, and that's where we typically would use it as an amplifier. Finally, in the saturation region. We have that the emitter base junction is forward biased 
and the collector base junction is also forward biased. And we can think of that as kind of an on switch that we're letting as much current as we can flow through the collector to the emitter. And in this case, I'm defining, which we can use as sort of approximate number, that's forward biased when the junction says is, is greater than 0.5 volts, and it's reverse biased if the junction is less than say 0.5 volts. But, as I also mentioned, that when we're forward biased, we'll assume that the, v, the base to emitter voltage will be 0.7 volts, typically, but the base to collector voltage, if we're forward biased, is only going to be 0.5 volts, and that's because it's much larger in area than the base emitter uh, junction. And the reason we, want, we care about this is this will determine what the collector emitter voltage is when we're in the saturation region, the difference between these two voltages. So if we look in the saturation region, we'll see that VCE is equal to 0.2 volts, which is just uh, 0 0.7 minus 0 0.5 volts. How do we get that? Well, that's just because the collector emitter voltage is equal to the collector base voltage minus the emitter base voltage. If we work through the formulas here, we'll see it's just 0 0.7 minus 0 0.5, which gives us 0 0.2 volts. So we have that in our saturation region, well, 0.2 volts from the collector emitter voltage in saturation. So we need equations for the three different regions of operations for this bipolar transistors. So let's look at our equations. When the cutoff region, what we have is that the emit emitter base junction and the collector base junction are both reverse biased. And so what we have is that the uh, base current is approximately zero because we have reverse biased diode and the collector current is also approximately equal to zero. So it's just uh, cut off. In the saturation region, we'll skip right to this one because this is the other sort of extreme example where it's completely on not used and it's not used as an amplifier. In this case, the emitter base junction is uh, forward biased. The collector ba base junction is also forward biased, so they're both forward biased. And as we just saw, the collector emitter voltage will be about 0.2 volts. And it'll actually be the VCE sat voltage. So if you're given the VCE sat voltage, then it would be whatever that be. It might be 150 millivolts, it might be 250 millivolts, but normally we can assume it's around 0.2 volts. Um, could get as low as 0.1, depending upon the, uh, again, the relative size between the um, emitter base junction and the collector base junction. Finally, in, in the area that we most want to use it as an amplifier in the active region, we have that the emitter base junction is forward biased and the collector base junction is reverse biased. So in this region, we actually still have current flowing. So even though we have a circuit or a, what seems to be a two back-to-back -back diodes like this, where this is the base collector and emitter, this is a voltage and we have, um, this might be let's say five volts up here. This might be 0 0.7, sorry. This might be 0. Point, 0 0.7 volts here. And this might be zero volts for the emitter. So current flows, because the base emitter current is flowing, current also wants to flow from the collector. And it w in, in some sense, it wants to go to the base, but because current is already flowing, it actually just skips right by because it's so thin and goes to the emitter instead. And this is the key why we needed our base um, to be very, very thin. So it had to be a thin region. So the current could flow directly from the collector to the emitter, but be controlled by the current that's flowing through the base. So I'm not going to go into the end of the device physics on why that works out, but the equation that this will give us is that our collector current becomes some scale current times E to the VBE based upon the base emitter voltage divided by the thermal voltage V sub T. So if you recall, VT is equal to KT over Q, where K is Boltzmann's constant, T is uh, temperature in absolute 
uh, degrees Kelvin, and Q is the charge of an electron. And then, then it's also multiplied by 1 plus VCE over VA. So this determines our output impedance that we are in the, um, in the active region. So if uh, VA goes to infinity, then this would be a, um, an ideal bipolar transistor with a R0, a small signal output impedance equal to infinity. As I mentioned, the scale IS is the scale current, and it's proportional to the base emitter junction area. So if one transistor has twice the base emitter junction area, then the scale current of it will be twice the size of another transistor. As I mentioned, VT is our thermal voltage, and it's equal to KT over Q, which is approximately 26 millivolts at room temperature. And VA is our early voltage, similar to what we saw in a MOSFET transistor, and determines the output impedance of the, of the transistor. So we have our NMOS transistor looking like this. This is our uh, collector current, emitter current, and the base current. And we can see very quickly that the emitter current here is equal to the base current plus the, emitter, uh, plus the collector current. So I sub E is equal to IB plus I sub C. Now in the active region, so we're still in the active region, we can also show that the collector current is beta times the base current, where beta is typically around 100, but it depends upon the doping levels, the base width, the, how you build the transistor. If it's a power transistor, it will have a lower beta, but typically, you can get betas of around 100 for a uh, bipolar transistor. So we see that the collector current is modulated um, by the a, a base current. We also saw we have that the uh, emitter current, because the, it is equal to the collector current, emitter current is the base current plus the collector current, I sub C is beta times IB, so we have that IE is equal to beta plus 1 times IB just combining this equation and this equation together. And then we can also rewrite this and make a new definition. Actually, we can redefine alpha to be beta over beta plus one. If we do that, we'll see that the collector current is equal to alpha times IE, where alpha is always some number slightly less than one. If beta is equal to 100, then alpha would equal to around uh, 0.99 for beta equal to 100. Now we need the small signal model for our transistors. And so we have, as before, we have two models. We have the pi model and the t model. The pi model is shown here, and it's identical to the model for uh, MOSFET transistors. The only difference now is that we actually have an impedance here rather than infinite impedance. So we have an impedance R sub pi, which has the voltage VBE across it. And then we have GM times VBE, as we had in the MOSFET transistor. We had GM VGS there. And we have R0, which is the output impedance. In the T model, we have um, an RE here, similar to what we had in a um, MOSFET case. We have I sub E, and the big difference here is we have alpha times IE. So this alpha is very important, because if alpha is equal to 1, then the current going to this must be 0, because then this current would equal this current, and then the base current would have to be 0. So you can think of a MOSFET actually has alpha equal to 1. But in a bipolar, because alpha is not equal to 1, it's some number slightly less than 1, then this current is a little bit larger than this current, so we do have a base current flowing in through here. And then we have R0 uh, across the collector and emitter. The equations for GM, GM is equal to the collector current divided by the thermal voltage, v VT, where VT is equal to KT over Q. RE, this resistor, is given by alpha over GM, which is also the same as the threshold, or sorry, the thermal voltage divided by the uh, emitter current. And R pi is just beta over GM. 
And finally, we have that R0, the upwind pin, is the magnitude of the early voltage divided by the collector current. Now we have some impedance rules, which we did not have in the MOSFET case. So we have to worry about some impedance rules for bipolar transistors in the uh, small signal analysis. And what we want to look at is what is the impedance looking into the base when I have an emitter resistance. We didn't worry about this in MOSFETs because the impedance looking into the gate of a transistor was always infinity. But in this case, that's not going to be the case. So our small signal model would look something like this. If we do the analysis, what we'll find is that the impedance here, looking into the base, is equal to beta plus 1 times the sum of these two, where this is an actual physical resistor that's been added into the emitter. So it's equal to beta plus 1 times Re, or Re over here, plus this capital Re here. And so we can also rewrite this as R pi plus beta plus 1 times capital Re, where, as I mentioned, Re is a physical resistor added into the emitter of the uh, transistor. And then we have the other case where we're actually looking back into the emitter of the transistor, and we have a physical resistor R sub B added into the base of the resistor. If we look at the small signal model, for that, it would look something like this. If we do the analysis, we'll see that this impedance here looking up into the emitter, Re, looks like um, Rb, this impedance, divided by beta plus 1, plus, one, plus Re, this small signal um, emitter resistance. And that's also equal to Rb plus R pi, where R pi was our hybrid pi impedance looking into the base. Uh, divide by beta plus 1. Now, I just want to look at the transistor FT of uh, MOSFETs and for um, bipolar transistors. So if you recall, FT is where the, the uh, current gain goes to 1. And for a MOSFET, we had that FT was equal to GM divided by 2 pi plus C divided by uh, divided by 2 pi times CGS plus CGD. For bipolar transistor, we see a very similar equation. So for the unity gain frequency for bipolar, so where the current gain goes to 1, it's equal to GM divided by 2 pi, divided by C pi plus C mu. So in this case, C mu, C pi, so we'll start with that one, C pi is the base to emitter capacitance, and C mu is the base to collector capacitance. So this is similar to the C gate to drain capacitance in a MOSFET, and this is similar to the gate to source uh, capacitance in a MOSFET. And what you find is that C pi and C CGS for a uh, MOSFET and C pi for a bipolar both depend upon the transistor sizing but generally, you'll find that C pi is less than the gate to source voltage for a MOSFET transistor, especially in uh, older technologies and not the most modern technologies. And we also have, uh, before we saw that for a MOSFET, the GM of a transistor was equal to 2 ID divided by the overdrive voltage, VO, V overdrive. And typically for a MOSFET, V overdrive is greater than about 100 millivolts. Otherwise, if you make the um, B overdrive even smaller than that, then the CGS would become very, very large because you'd have to have a very large width in order to keep the V overdrive voltage very, very small. Uh, so in fact, it's normally greater than 100 millivolts and often if you're trying to go fast, the B overdrive might be 200 millivolts. So it'll be even uh, a higher voltage. And if it's a higher voltage, that means you'll have a smaller GM for the same current. So you'll have to burn more current to get the, same, to get the GM that you may want. In a bipolar transistor, so if you go up and you look at our notes that we just have up above, the GM was equal to the collector current divided by the uh, thermal voltage. And VT is equal to 25 millivolts at room temperature. So we can see that they're very similar here. We have, this is the drain current and this is the collector current. 
So if there's a current that we have that's fixed, we can now look at the ratio of GM of the MOSFET versus the GM of the bipolar transistor. So for the case where the drain current and the collector current are the same, we see that the GM of the bipolar transistor is going to be about twice the GM of the MOSFET transistor in the case where the V overdrive is equal to 100 millivolts because of 100 here, um, it means it's um, four times uh, larger than VT, but there's a factor of two over here. So the overall is just twice. So we have a factor of two here. And because we also see that C pi is less than CGS, we see that generally the FT of a bipolar transistor is higher than the FT of a MOSFET transistor. That was certainly the case um, in older technologies. So what that means is that you can have a faster circuit if you're using the same power in bipolar um, in bipolar transistors into analog circuits because your FTs are higher, you can potentially go for uh, make the overall circuit faster. Now you can also trade that off, and you can say, well, look, I don't need it to go faster. Instead, I'd like it to go and be lower power, and so you can drive it with a lower current for the bipolar circuit. Um, and have the same speed, but use less power than the CMOS circuit. So you, you can either make your bipolar circuits for the same current go faster, or you can reduce the current in the bipolar circuits and have the same speed in bipolar as MOSFET, but save power. Okay, and that ends uh, this uh, video, and thanks for watching.